So good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Tricia Gordon. I'm facilitating today's teaching and learning call, uh, January 17th, 2018. Uh, so our first call of the year. And uh, we're going to have a couple of updates and then welcome Jeff and Kyle from NYU to share um, information on their usability testing and tool development at NYU, which uh, should be really interesting. So um, let's see. Do we have any updates? Neil, I'm going to turn to you. Yeah, sure. I almost always have something, right? Um, yeah. So we're in um, Sakai 12.0 release candidate one. And um, we're focusing right now on Samago test and quiz uh, testing. Uh, testing. Oh, I go there. I think it's coming from Lisa. Oh, Lisa, I'm going to Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so we could use. We've had a. We've had a pretty good amount of testing on there and found a few bugs, but uh, we could use more testing. And then, so if people are interested in participating, please contact me. I just point you to the instructions, but I'm sort of in the middle of, you know, updating the test plans while at the same time we're doing testing. So. Is a little bit of a moving target, um, and uh, Sakai Camp. Uh, I, you're still welcome to come if you haven't chosen to come. I'm guessing it's a little late for most folks to make plans, uh, so that's coming up uh, this weekend. Um, and something else that I wanted to mention is BrowserStack.com, which is a really cool tool for. You can test on different, it has a number of different features. The only feature that I've really explored so far my, uh, myself is to use it to test on different environments. So let's say you're on a Mac and you want to test on Windows, you can do that. If you want to test on an Android phone, an iPhone, an iPad. Um, so it seemed like when we first got it, as a, uh, when they awarded us the licenses uh, for being an open source project, that there was a limit. Then I got an email that sort of indicates maybe we don't have such a limit. So I would kind of like to do a test and award a number of different licenses to people to try out. And if we do hit a limit, I'll let you know and I'll revoke licenses so that we have enough for the actual needs of the community. But if we are don't have a limit, then it could be something that our QA team can really um, take advantage of. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. So we should contact you if we want right. to count. Right. And I would encourage okay. you to do so because I'd like to kind of experiment and see if we really do have, I think they awarded us five licenses initially. And I think it may be beyond that. So it'd be kind of uh, fun just to see if we can, you know, award mm -hmm. seven, yeah. eight, nine, ten licenses and see what's going on with that. Um, other than that, um, I guess there's lots of other you know, farm projects kind of percolating, um, but I think that's mostly, oh, Open Aperio. Yeah, so Open Aperio, um, please remember to get your presentation proposals in. Uh, the deadline is January 26th, which is a week from this Friday, right? And um, I am organizing or uh, co-organizing a presentation on community, um, which is gonna include uh, Tiffany, uh, accessibility and Miguel, on uh, internationalization, it'd be great to have one or two more people. And typically that one is giving the big picture of all the kinds of activity going on in the community, as well as doing a call for participation. So anyone who's interested in representing some subgroup in Sakai and uh, being part of that, that would be, that's usually a lot of fun. So I'd invite you to be part of that presentation specifically. And you can do that in addition to your own ideas. Mm -hmm. I think that covers it. Awesome. Thank you, Neil. And I see Louisa has noted that Atlas is also now open. So um, submissions for that is February 26th. Due by 20, February 26th. And Louisa has put the URL in the chat and also on the Etherpad. So please go check it out. All right, anybody else have any announcements before we move into our main speakers? All righty then, 
So we have Jeff Posh and Kyle Bly from NYU uh, presenting on their usability testing and tool development at NYU. And uh, guys, I didn't ask you, um, I need to give one of you, I assume, presenter privileges. Uh, yeah, that would be great. If you could give it to me, I can go ahead and upload the presentation in here. Okay. Okay, there. great. Thank you. Okay, so one second here while I get the presentation uploaded. Should only take a second here. Sure. So, uh, so thank you so much to Trisha and Matt for uh, for having us today for uh, being able to talk about this usability testing uh, that we've been doing here at NYU, uh, as well as how that relates to a resources project that we're currently working on. So let me go ahead and select this. Okay, sorry for the delay here. No problem. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys for having us. Really appreciate it. This has been a um, you know, usability has been a big focus um, at NYU. Usability, usability testing, and and just kind of looking across not only Sakai but other applications. Um, there's been a big push for it, so we're we're happy to uh, happy to be here. Good. Thanks. Great. Okay, so uh, the presentation should be there now. So hopefully you can see that on the screen. Um, yeah. Great. So this is basically a rehash of a presentation that we gave at the Sakai Virtual Conference back in November. Uh, but we just wanted to be able to sort of tell folks about uh, the usability testing efforts that we've led here at NYU and how that's impacted some of the different projects that we've done. So uh, taking a look at the agenda for this presentation. Uh, so we're going to talk about usability testing just in general at a glance, as well as how that relates to a few of the projects that we've done. Uh, so the new grade book for Sakai 11, some Sakai UI improvements, uh, basically the new skin for Sakai 12, uh, some left menu subpage navigation enhancements that are also in Sakai 12, and the resources redesign that it's going to be coming to a future version of Sakai. Okay. So uh, to get started here, so what is user experience testing or usability testing. Uh, basically, those two terms, they can be used interchangeably. Um, they can also be known as uh, UX or UXD. Uh, these are basically a key component of what's known as user-centered or user experience design. So that's a lot of jargon. But um, basically, it comes down to some pretty straightforward principles and concepts. Uh, basically, it is used to evaluate the usability of a system, a website, uh, a workflow, or sort of any individual aspect thereof. Uh, and this is done not just with technology products, but all sorts of everyday sort of physical products as well. So your coffee maker has likely gone through iterative usability testing to get your interactions with it just right, just like with an application. Um, and this is based not only on feedback from users, but the behaviors of actual users with that product. So different from surveys or focus groups where you're just getting responses from users after the fact. Uh, when you're doing usability testing, you're actually seeing them interact with the product in real time, and you're seeing stumbling blocks and the intuitive interactions happen in real time. Uh, in the past, the common approach to usability testing was to conduct this testing in sort of large scale labs. So you had a massive number of participants, expensive equipment, one-way mirrors, you know, groups of observers that are there either in person or watching over a video feed, et cetera. So very much like a traditional sort of academic study. Um, however, more recent research shows uh, that successful usability testing can be conducted in a much more lightweight, but still very sort of structured way. Um, so, you know, th with more recent usability testing, this doesn't necessarily need to be done in a lab even. Uh, it can be done almost anywhere. So you can actually just travel to a participant's own office location or to a sort of general meeting place, so long as it's quiet enough. And uh, that way, you're working with them where they're most comfortable. And typically, you can use a participant's own computer. Uh, you can just use some simple screen capture software to be able to sort of see their screen if anyone is going to be joining remotely, uh, sort of what we're, we're doing right now. Uh, they can then watch it in and see it that way. Um, so this gives you a lot of flexibility with the testing that you do. 
And uh, research shows, uh, and we'll be happy to send along this presentation later, although I think you can also download it here. Um, but research shows that you don't need huge numbers of people to conduct usability testing effectively. Really, uh, all you really need is five to 10 participants to identify what works and what doesn't with your product. Uh, anything beyond that sort of five to 10 range and you start seeing diminished returns. So this actually makes it very easy to be able to cut and conduct lightweight usability testing on your own. Okay, so uh, usability testing is frequently used as part of an iterative, agile product development cycle. Yes, uh, more jargon. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, basically, it means that this testing is done in concert with development so that the developers and the designers can identify problems and address them early on uh, so that the product ends up meeting real user needs. Because again, uh, you're getting feedback from users as they're talking out loud during the testing, and you're actually seeing their behavior as they're clicking around. So this ends up allowing the designers and the developers to adapt the functionality to ensure the best user experience possible. So here we see this sort of graphic of a development cycle here on the right. Um, this is the model that we followed for the different projects that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. Uh, and basically it all starts with the idea of user research. Uh, this is what informs the general needs for the product. So the big one here is observation. So how people are currently using a tool or application. Uh, for example, how faculty and students are using the resources tool today. Uh, so this is how you, know, you would sit down with the user, you would ask them, how do you upload files? You know, how do you structure your course content? Uh, how do you batch upload content? So these sorts of questions can then sort of start to inform these needs. Um, and this can be structured in nature, or it can be a little bit more loose because sometimes you're going to gain interesting insights by letting the participant here kind of go wild and just go off and talk about their specific use cases. Um, in addition, user research can include survey data or system data or you know, potentially even focus groups. Uh, this shows you where, for example, dissatisfaction is highest and you have an opportunity to provide improvements or new novel functionality. Uh, and these are sort of broader types of research. For, for user experience testing, though, it's really about that in-person observing of a person's interactions with the product. So that's one aspect of the usability testing portion. Uh, another aspect of this is competitive analysis. So looking to other comparable products to see what works and what doesn't. Uh, in our own product development, a frequent refrain is, you know, don't reinvent the wheel, right? Uh, if another product has figured out an approach that works best, pay attention to that and see if that makes sense for you as well. Uh, because when you try and develop new functionality that hasn't been seen anywhere else before, chances are it isn't going to be as intuitive as something that someone has used every single day for various purposes. So uh, then you have this iterative agile approach. So you design based off of the testing and research that you've done. And then you work with the developers to implement it. And then the cycle repeats and you do another round of testing, hence the iterative part of all of this. Uh, so yeah, basically you use Risa Research to identify what's wrong with the, uh, the current product. You gather other information about it. And then you either work up some design mockups or you, know, you, you design and work with developers to implement. And then you return for another round of testing. So. Uh, when you return to testing, you either return with mockups, uh, and we've used paper prototypes or screenshots to work with, or we've developed sort of higher resolution HTML prototypes that don't necessarily require full on development, uh, so that you have a pretty good idea from there, and then you can go ahead and develop a minimum viable product that meets those needs. Uh, so again, this, this sort of iterative approach, it's allowing you to shape and improve the product, which means that you know at each step of the way that you're headed in the right direction. Uh, this way you don't go full on in a direction that you think will work, develop the full on product, and then go back and find that users don't end up actually liking it. Okay, so this is just some quick summary details here. Um, so you have a small number of users, again, five to 10 users. Um, you conduct it in person, usually one-on-one, -on -one, and we frequently go to people's offices to conduct this testing. Uh, we do a combination of structured testing, uh, walking through a series of specific tasks, as well as unstructured testing, which is getting general feedback from participants about what makes sense and what doesn't. Uh, we try to record sessions 
when possible uh, so that we can review them later. So we have a generic video release form, we have participants sign, and then we use screen capture software to record the video and audio from the session. Uh, these sessions are usually pretty short, 20 to 45 minutes, and we'll either have another observer along with the, uh, the testing facilitator, uh, they're in person, or available via web conference using that screen capture software. Okay. So this is just a quick summary slide of the testing that we've conducted to date uh, here at NYU. So this is not fully up to date. Uh, this is the presentation we did back in November and we've done a little additional testing since then. Um, but basically, uh, and we'll look at a few of these in detail in a minute, but cumulatively, uh, as of November, we had tested 71 participants, uh, closer to around, I think around 80 now. Um, so of these 71 participants, 51 were tested by either Jeff or myself, the, the product team here at NYU. Uh, in addition to that though, uh, we had 20 participants that were tested by members of the Sakai community as part of the release of Sakai 11 uh, using some protocols that we developed. Uh, this was part of the effort to rename uh, and folks that were around for the change to 11 will remember this, my workspace, uh, we changed that to home in Sky 11. And we wanted to make sure that that naming convention made sense. We did a lot of testing around that. We had a lot of help uh, from Walsh University and the University of Hawaii uh, in ensuring that these new naming conventions in 11 worked for faculty and students. Uh, so this was testing you know, conducted using the protocols that we developed. And next, we're going to take a look at three of the projects listed here uh, that we worked on. So these include the new gradebook that came in Sakai 11, uh, the Sakai 12 UI, uh, so basically the new skin for Sakai 12, and a new lesson subpage navigation feature that's in Sakai 12 that we think is pretty cool. Um, before we get into that though, we will also take a look at the redesigned resources tool at the end of the presentation here. And we have some sort of nice representative mockups that uh, sort of show what we envision the tool to end up looking like. Okay, so. Now getting into the details here. We'll start with the new gradebook. So uh, the gradebook UX testing was developed in response to a faculty satisfaction survey here that we conducted at NYU. Uh, what we found in that survey that the gradebook actually had the lowest satisfaction of score of any tool in Sakai. Uh, so again, this was just from NYU faculty, but we really found that there was a need here that we wanted to develop a new and improved, uh, much more usable tool. So we, based off of that satisfaction, we talked uh, to a number of different uh, universities and commercial vendors. So we collaborated with Notre Dame and some commercial vendors on this product and we completed usability testing and began development. Uh, so we tested with a total of 17 participants uh, in collaboration with an accessibility and usability firm, uh, the Pasiello Group uh, or TPG, which has actually done some amazing work for the Rally Project for accessibility here with the Sky community. So we worked with them to develop a testing protocol, and then we developed an iterative cycle of mockups, HTML prototypes, and continued to go back to, with participants and work with them as we developed this product. So here you can see sort of the development and uh, iterative nature of this. This was a very early mockup, which you can very much tell here, which then became a clickable HTML prototype. And then based off of the findings that we did with usability testing, we found that there were a number of things that we needed to add to make it more useful. Uh, these were not things that we had thought of originally, but that really made sense as we continued to go along. Things like having a saving and save notification at the top of the tool. Um, people found that even though there were indicators in cell for saving, that the gradebook itself should show that everything has been saved. So we followed the model that you see in Google Docs and other Google Drive items where you get this constant notification at the top of the screen. Uh, we also wanted to provide more descriptive error messages in line. So not just a red exclamation point, but an actual error telling you what might have gone wrong in a cell if an error happens. Uh, as well as displaying comments in line when the comment icon is selected. Originally, we thought that when clicking on the comment bubble that's in the new gradebook, it would just open a light box immediately. Uh, however, people wanted to be able to see comments without having to actually go and complete a workflow. Additionally, just general UI things like zebra striping in the spreadsheet view to help with being able to scan across rows. 
uh, being able to provide a section filter instead of having an additional section column that was originally in the spreadsheet, which actually took up too much room and didn't allow you to see enough of your gradebook items. Uh, and lastly, and this was actually a very interesting one that came about as a result of usability testing, was a dedicated student review mode. Uh, instructors wanted to be able to preview the gradebook from a given student's perspective, which is not something that was previously available. So we wanted to be able to provide that and give the instructors this uh, assurance that they can see exactly what students see. So we added that with this nice blur on the spreadsheet background, and this allows instructors to even show students their view of the gradebook without showing them other students' uh, information if they come in for office hours, for example. So these are some of the findings from the new gradebook. From there, we went and we had a final tool that we were finally able to develop for this. So this is the new gradebook as it appears in Sakai 11. So some general statistics from the new gradebook usability testing as well. So we asked a series of standardized questions to each participant during usability testing, which we could then sort of aggregate together as these statistics. And we got some very great feedback for the new gradebook. So over the course of usability testing, we found that uh, 12 out of 13 participants at one point found the new gradebook to be easy to use. Uh, one person found it average and zero found it difficult to use. Uh, compared to the other gradebooks, uh, so not just the existing Sakai gradebook, but other LMS gradebooks, uh, all 13 found it better. And as far as likelihood to recommend this new gradebook, 12 were likely to recommend and one was neutral. So very positive feedback that we got as a result of this usability testing. Okay, so the outcomes for this, uh, we piloted this locally at NYU in spring 2017 became the default gradebook for us this past summer. And we found that adoption levels of the new gradebook uh, showed a 28% increase over adoption from the previous summer. Uh, also, this is the default gradebook in Sakai 11, as we all know, and it continues to be developed and refined for Sakai 12 and forward. Uh, so for Sakai 12, we've implemented a new uh, lazy loading table, which basically provides infinite scroll. If you have a significantly large class with like a thousand students, you don't have to page through different parts of the table. It will just load what needs to be loaded. And we're getting some great development from other members of the Sky community. So it's really great to see that happening. Okay, so that's the new grade book. Uh, moving on to the Sakai UI. So uh, basically for the user interface in Sakai. When we updated to Sakai 11 locally here at NYU, we updated this, the, the core Sakai 11 UI to provide a lighter, cleaner, and more consistent interface for us here locally at NYU. And um, we had a lot of great positive feedback from that. Um, the, uh, we placed a lot of emphasis on styling and consistency, especially across different device sizes. So we wanted to provide a mobile view for our local UI that would be very consistent with the desktop UI. Uh, so for this project, we tested a total of seven participants uh, iterating on designs before working with the developers on it to actually get it implemented. So this was the Sakai 11 core UI. Uh, so when you download Sakai Fresh, this is what it looks like. And then we did some mockups to sort of show what it could look like from our uh, perspective. So we did uh, these general mockups. We had sort of this white header at the top of the page here. Uh, we took the synoptic tools and put them in these sort of uh, raised boxes with a little box shadow behind them. Uh, kept the left menu nice and wide here. And we conducted usability testing with these mockups. The final design uh, that we got, and this is the, actually the final product in production today, looks very similar. You can see that looks pretty much identical with exception to the fact that we had a purple header. And that is the result of feedback from testers. So the findings here were that we wanted to retain a boldly colored top header to separate the platform from the larger browser. Uh, people frequently found that they couldn't find where the website ended and where their browser, at the actual top of their screen, began. Um, so we were able to keep that in there while retaining a very light, clean look for the rest of the UI. Uh, we also uh, styled the synoptic tools in a clean, consistent fashion. And this actually, that, that sort of boxed look with the, uh, the box shadow here, that actually unifies the style across other areas of the UI as well. So we made some changes to the syllabus tool. There's the new gradebook settings, uh, expandable accordion menus, the lessons tool, et cetera. So we're able to start creating this sort of consistent style in the UI. 
Uh, and we also, again, ensured that the mobile user experience and system navigation remain consistent with the desktop version. So some stats here. Um, as far as the experience with the UI was concerned, of the seven participants, five found it enjoyable, two found it neutral, but none found it annoying or negative. Uh, comparison of the UI to the existing system, six out of seven found it better. And as a comparison of the UI to other LMSs, five out of seven found it better. So this brings us to Sakai 12. Uh, at last year's Sakai camp, uh, there was discussion about taking that skin and applying it for the next release of Sakai. So we did some work and we worked with Longside on this as well to uh, backport this skin into the Sakai community and get this skin up and ready for the next version of Sakai. Uh, and a big thank you as well to, uh, to Notre Dame, to UVA and other schools that uh, applied this skin to their version of Sakai 11 as well. So this is the Sakai 12 UI as it sits today. As you can see, it looks very similar to our local skin for Sakai 11. Uh, there's some very minor differences, but for the most part, the skin is pretty much identical. So we're very happy about that. Uh, and then here is a mobile comparison. So you can start to see how this consistency comes into play. Uh, on the left is the core Sakai 11 UI, which looks very different actually from the desktop UI for Sakai 11. And then on the right is the Sakai 12 UI, where you get the same sort of look to the different top menus, where you have a colored bar at the top of the screen with your different uh, things for the, for example, the, um, the noodle contributions for the bullhorns. You then have your sites row, which replaces the favorite sites bar with a sites button. And then there is a third row that gives you a tools menu and your current selected tool. Okay, so the outcomes from this. Uh, so again, this became the default UI in NYU classes as of January 2017, so last year. Uh, and it is going to be the default UI for all users that upgrade to Sakai 12. Um, and this moves Sakai towards a more mobile-first strategy with a consistent user experience occurring across different device sizes. All right, moving on to the next project then. Uh, we have a lesson subpage navigation feature. So this came about as a result of some local uh, needs that we encountered here at NYU for providing improved navigation for sequence learning modules in the lessons tool. Basically, when you have multiple lessons tool instances in the left menu, each of which have subpages. Uh, so this was requested for online and blended courses here at NYU, and it wanted to be modeled after Open edX's accordion-based left menu navigation, uh, which basically allows you to be able to see a condensed version of like a table of contents in the left menu. You click into entries and then you can see the subpages nested underneath. So we want to provide something similar to that and hopefully provide some improvements as well uh, using the lessons tool. So we tested a total of eight participants, uh, again, iterating upon designs and interaction behavior there. So on the left here, you have the default left menu uh, with a lesson subpage uh, selected. So currently, you know, if you're in a subpage in a lessons tool instance, you only see the main lessons tool that you're on right there. Now, when you have the lessons subpage navigation feature enabled, however, you get these accordion menus, which will expand and you can actually see the subpage that you're currently on. And there's some nice animations as well, so that when you click into various subpages, uh, you'll only see the currently expanded subpage. It gives you some nice functionality there. So some findings from that. Uh, when we conducted this usability testing on basically uh, open edX design for this, we were able to find that open sections should be collapsed when you click into another section. Otherwise, you would have a left menu that would just expand and expand and expand. Uh, you could, we also wanted to make it easier to select top level lessons pages. So when you open a section for uh, a given lessons instance, uh, you can then click on the top level page to go into that top level page, which sort of serves in many ways as a table of contents. Uh, and we wanted to retain subpage highlighting when clicking into sub subpages. So the outcomes from this. Uh, this was piloted in spring 2017 at NYU, and uh, it became available to all instructors at NYU as of July 2017. So this was contributed back as a community feature for Sky 12, 
And again, this is just a feature that you can toggle on and off at the site level from the uh, site info area. Uh, and it provides flexibility for displaying content and structuring course navigation. So if as an instructor, you want to be able to take advantage of this and have multiple lessons instances, there's a toggle now that's available in the um, add edit pages screen. And that allows you to be able to turn this feature on. Okay. And now moving on to resources. So this is one that is sort of in progress right now. Uh, so a redesigned resources tool. So the resources tool is used obviously heavily by faculty and students. Uh, and we have found that there's a lot of features in here that, uh, sorry about that. There's a lot of features in here that uh, faculty and students really want to have to be able to make it comparable to other online file repositories that they may be used to. So that includes being able to have drag and drop throughout, being able to have search within the tool, being able to have built-in file previewing so that you don't need to download uh, a file just to be able to access it, being able to just preview it directly within Sakai, and having improved integrations with external sources. So what do we mean by that? Uh, integrations with things like Google Drive or with your library's uh, 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 resources, for example. So we want to be able to have these features added into the resources tool, and we want to be able to improve the user experience and UI in the process. So, so far, we have tested a total of 11 participants, uh, and again, doing that iteration of designs. So we've created uh, a series of uh, high-fidelity mock-ups that we have sat through with faculty and students, uh, basically paper prototypes that they can sort of walk through and that they can circle on the page what they think that different interactions might do. And we've iterated on those designs before working with our developers to start developing that. So what I'd like to share next are some mock-ups of what this redesigned resources tool is uh, going to end up looking like, or at least what we hope it ends up looking like. So here uh, we have a default view of the resources tool, where you're sitting at the top level of your resources. Uh, so a number of things that I'll point out here. So you have a basically a view of the different folders or files that are sitting at that top level here. And the folder structure is mirrored in a left-hand panel. So this gives you the ability to always see what folder you're sitting in in your resources. Uh, we're also considering having options like being able to favorite files that will be available from a favorite section within a resources tool, as well as being able to see the most recently updated uh, or uploaded files here and the trash. We're servicing the site quota here at the bottom. We have a search at the top that will stay persistent no matter where you've clicked into the resources tool. You can search by the file name, file type, file creator, for example. And we have a couple of options over here. So we have an option to be able to see files either in a list view or as a grid. And we have our settings over here. So uh, what we're envisioning is being able to have drag and drop be available throughout this tool. So if you wanted to be able to upload a file rather than having to go immediately to a file upload screen, you could drag content where you want it to appear. So if you want to add a file to week one, you could just drag a file on top of week one. And you could do it within this view or within the left-hand menu here. And if you wanted to move content around, you could also move it from week one to week two you could be inside of week one and drag it over to week two if you wanted to. Okay, so that is sort of at a high level what we're picturing the default screen to look like. This is a view inside a tool here, uh, or I'm sorry, inside a folder here. So now I'm inside of week one, you can see it highlighted on the left and I can see the files that are inside of week one here. Uh, one thing you might notice is that there are no longer any of those action sort of buttons that appear next to every single folder or item inside of your resources. Uh, we found that that was really frustrating and confusing for users to have all these different buttons. So now if you want to upload a file, there's a single persistent new resource button that you could click. And when you click on that, you can then add a new folder, upload a new file, you know, basically all the options that you have now for creating content, as well as if people did want to plug in any external integrations, for example, uh, we have an integration with Google Drive that we're developing. Uh, you could add a Google Drive item directly into your resources from here. And the behavior here is that 
similar to Google Drive. Uh, when you're inside of a folder, the default is going to be adding content inside of the current folder. Although when you're adding content, if you select it from this new resource option, you have the choice of determining where that content is going to go. Okay. Another thing that we are considering here is having contextual actions be available just using simple right-click functionality. So if you select a file, you don't necessarily have to right-click. There's going to be options that are going to appear contextually on the upper right. So you could preview a file, edit the file's details, uh, grab the link to the file, send it to the trash, or get more actions. Or you could right-click on it and select from any of the actions that are available for it right from there. And two of the actions that I will just highlight briefly here are the ability to do file previewing. So if I right click on a file or uh, just basically click on this little preview button here, we're envisioning having a file preview display directly on top of Sakai there. So I can see the actual file without having to download it. And this would work for PDFs, uh, documents, video files, basically anything that you would upload into your resources from here. Another thing that we've been considering is improvements to the uh, edit options for files, basically to clarify and make it just look more straightforward and more immediately evident what functionality is doing. So this is basically the same edit options that currently exist for a file uh, when you edit its options in resources, but we've cleaned it up a little bit. So uh, you can select an item availability toggle, which will basically contextually show who has access to it. So if this is disabled, you wouldn't see this at all because the file is not available to anyone but you as the instructor. But once you make it available, then you determine whether it's available to your entire site, to select groups. And then we're considering having options for making it available to anyone, for example, at your university. So anyone at NYU with the link would be able to get this without having to um, or basically it would provide you with a single sign-on and then you could access it. You could also then make it public, which would make it available without single sign-on. And then we have our other options like limiting access by date, sending email notifications. All of that, as it is dependent on item availability, would only show up when the item is marked as being available. So these are some of the things that we're considering doing to sort of clean up the interactions within the resources tool. Um, and I know there have been some comments here, so I can jump back there in a minute because the last slide that we have here is just some resources. So if you want to go ahead and download this presentation, this has uh, all of the sort of uh, resources that we've looked at re with regards to usability testing and uh, uh, the various you know, approaches with regards to that. Okay, great. I've, I've rambled for long enough, so let's, <laughs> let's go ahead and... Uh, Kyle, we, I think we've all been mesmerized. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, these are really exciting things. So, um, no, this has been really good. Oh, and, great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, Neil had a question uh, a little further back when you were talking more about um, comparing, you know, getting your um, UX uh testing participants to compare to other lmss do you happen to know what other lmss they were compared against um sometimes sometimes we did uh sometimes we didn't we, we sort of kept mm. that question more general um sometimes the participants would tell us sometimes they would not uh but we wanted to find out basically just whether they had familiarity with other approaches to using functionality and how they felt that it worked with regards to that. Yeah, but, it, it typically it typically was Blackboard because that's what we were coming from. So. Ah, I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Jennifer Ludiana says they love the new grade book and are planning to adopt it over um, late spring summer. And uh, UVA is hoping to do the same once oh, great. we apply our customizations. <laughs> so. Awesome. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So, I had a question about the uh, subpage navigation in lessons. Does Absolutely. You mentioned that um, you could toggle this on and off at the site level. And I wondered if this was also, I mean, can you turn it on globally and, and you know, then turn it off at the site level versus? 
turning it on only at the site level or how does that work? Yeah. That's yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. I, I was just gonna say, yeah, you can, you can default it on, um, you know, do we have the picture of the toggle? Uh, we don't. No, oh, okay. No, 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 no problem. Um, yeah, you could, you could, you could default it on uh, pretty easily, and then, um, and then users could turn it off as they, as they wish. Um, I know there's also the ability to. I think we built in a property to hide. Uh, so the to the toggles in uh, is actually an added at tools to turn it on, and I'm pretty sure that we put in a property to hide that. Um, oh, okay. So I th I think if you want. So I think you can either hide it completely. You might even be able to toggle it on and not let people tog toggle it off. Right. So it's you know it's pretty flexible. Yeah, excellent. That's we like flexibility for sure. Uh, Neil, you had a question about bullhorns. Yeah, so bullhorns is off by default on twelve, but I think one of the uh things we're trying to figure out is how not how how uh, notification should work i know in the dashboard which we've now deprecated uh there was some evolution that was going on with resources of wanting to show when new resources were were added but then that got to be really overwhelming so there was clumping of resources together there was different strategies that were being explored i'm wondering if you all had thought about um, what the notification structure might look like from from resources to users Honestly, no. <laughs> um, and I think it's a good question because I, I guess, you know, you know, Bullhorn is going to be, you know, sort of watching for um, notifications, I guess. I, I don't know that much about it, but, but it could inform something we do on our end in terms of how that information is provided or how it's packaged. I think that is the right, and I think this came up somewhere before around bullhorns, like not not telling people sort of everything that happens, but bundling them in some way. So yeah, I think that's for further discussion. Yeah, but man, I'm telling you, if even half of the stuff that you're thinking about for resources comes, you know, whenever that happens, it's going to be awesome and especially preview please make that happen <laughs> i think a preview feature is you know where it's at yeah well we we have it we have that working in a development environment so oh, yeah. we're, we're hmm. yeah it works we're really excited about that um so yeah we're excited <laughs> <laughs> So we are too. Anybody else have any questions for Jeff and Kyle? Louisa says she's excited too. And uh, Louisa wondered if the resources changes were coming in Sakai 12 and we and Neil responded that they're not. So we know that. But the lessons navigation is in 12. So that is definitely something to look forward to there. And so where would you guys say you are in terms of the resources um, proposed changes and, and your development of that? Uh, so, I mean, as, yeah, getting con contributing back to the next release or. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, so, I mean, we, we would like to be able to have faculty using, you know, to use the jargon, a minimum viable product, um, you know, by summer at the latest. Uh, you know, it may be, you know, sort of selected faculty who, you know, maybe they're maybe they're running the new resources tool alongside the old resources tool, mm -hmm. maybe hiding it, maybe hiding the old one. Who who knows? Um, right. But right. we'd like that happening in summer so we we get it out there in the wilderness, um, and you know and a population that's willing to do it. And then we wanna have a larger rollout um, in fall, probably not Big Bang. So that, that's kind of the timing of our development. We'll see where that fits um, in terms of the community release cycle, but that's, that's where we are. Awesome. 
Super excited. Charles Bristow asks if the changes to resources will also be reflected in Dropbox. Yeah, I mean, we they really should be. <laughs> we haven't um, we haven't we haven't touched we haven't touched that yet. Um, but ultimately, yes, they they should. And we also want to be taking a look as well as the, at the uh, the attachments screens that show up in Sakai. So basically, when you add an attachment to like an assignment, for example, uh, we'll oh. also want to eventually try and take a look at that as well. Oh, right, because that drills down into resources too, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what one of the um, and and sorry, I got, I got booted. I guess I'm the only one who got booted out of Big Blue Button. <laughs> I, I got booted out for I a little while. Yeah, that. it was weird. Um, I but but anyway, so I don't know if this um, I don't know if this came up. But what was just said? I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> what were we talking but, about? <laughs> uh, drilling, making the changes in a, where you attach things to assignments, etc., and Dropbox. Um, yeah, there was something else in there. Sorry, I totally lost it. Um, yeah, it'll come back to me anyway. Yeah, it will. It will. Oh, I know what it, I know what it was. Sorry. It's, it's just, you know, in terms of resources, you know, one of, one of the reasons, uh, and justifications we had for doing it is it's, you know, we have, we have, uh, reports that show resources, resources and messages. We use messages. I know some people use a different tool for it, but they're the most used tools, and we can see that you know quantitatively. So it was an easy sell here to say, "Hey, why don't we do something that impacts the you know the most used tool?" And you know, as Kyle pointed out, that also touches you know any kind of when you're doing attachments, and then um, as Charles pointed out, it also touches Dropbox. So it's um, you know pretty wide coverage. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, kudos to you guys for, you know, all the awesome changes that you've been making and your choices for what to address have been spot on. <laughs> concerned. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for the support. <laughs> Appreciate yeah. it. And for the and for the time today. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, thank you guys. Uh, so I see Kyle has posted a link to the presentation into the chat, and I'm going to copy and paste that into the Etherpad as well. So thank you for that, Kyle. And um, I, uh, if there are no other questions for Kyle and Jeff, we're going to move on to uh, wrap up the meeting with some uh, discussion around next meeting topics. So. Um, on February 7th, Jennifer Ludiana is going to present on LTI integrations in Sakai at Walsh University. So that should be really interesting. Thank you for that, Jennifer. But we have the following three um, meeting times wide open for topics and presenters. So uh, would anybody like to volunteer? You don't have to do it now. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you would like to, um, let's go ahead and get you scheduled. Going once, going twice. Okay, well, hopefully um, we can uh, get some volunteers for some um, presentations. Yeah. I do have a, I was waiting for others before just, you know, piping in my voice. Um, so a couple of ideas or one idea, of course, is uh, Jira Palooza. We haven't done that in a while. And I keep debating, and maybe this is a question for the facilitator to discuss, how frequently would be good just to have that irregular pulse? Because I do think there are Jiras out there that, that could use some teaching and learning input. Um, so that's a general thing, and that could go in any of the open spaces or do a different you know, Wednesday. And the other idea was going back to the bullhorns, because as I mentioned, the bullhorns is off in 12 by default. And the reason it's off is because it wasn't clear if people, if it had the right set of notifications or enough notifications going to it um, by default. So we didn't want like an unpleasant surprise where people were expect or students would expect certain notifications they weren't getting. And, you know, complain to their instructor. So I thought it might be worth having a teaching and learning review, or maybe it's a usability review or both around, hey, what would typically be 
uh, you know, good set of notifications um, to have by default so we can get that turned on for a later release. That's a great idea. I'd, I'd love to do that sooner than later. Cool. Um, and another thing that uh, I was actually going to bring this up at Sakai Camp, but it doesn't, you know, I should bring it up here too, is um, I've gotten some feedback from folks here at the University of Virginia that the lessons tool is so feature rich, but it's really not intuitive to use. And a lot of people don't use it for that reason. It's just too complicated maybe too much going on. And so, you know, I'm thinking that that is a tool that has so much promise, um, but it may need some redesign work as well. And it might be something worth focusing on and getting some input from this people who join this call for teaching and learning. And any reactions to that suggestion? Just curious. Hello. There's um, some <laughs> chatting. There's some um, discussion in the chat. There is. Yeah. But for some reason, it's not showing up for me. Okay, because Louisa and and Charles both said that that sounded like a good idea. And Kyle also thinks it's a good idea. So yeah, there's some chat going on there. Okay, and there was also okay. Louisa had a suggestion for another for a presentation as well in there. Oh, uh, Louisa, I completely missed it. I'm, for some reason, the chat is not updating for me. I don't know why. Oh, that's weird. That's really weird. Yeah. Yeah, Louisa was asking if she could have 20, February 21st for uh, people oh. to go through the Atlas application. And would there be interest in that? To go through them? Is that what you were suggesting? Do you want to talk, uh, Louisa? Yeah, come online. Uh, yeah, so let me try my audio. Uh, it, it, there was some noise this morning. Uh, you guys hear me fine? Yeah. Okay. Um, because we're uh, seeking applications right now, the Atlas Awards, um, I'm thinking and the due date is February 26, right? So 21st is a week from that. Uh, if I, I wonder if there's enough interest uh, in the community, so we could do a Atlas uh, Q and A session, and we can also introduce what we have done, previous winners, uh, what we have seen in the community. Uh, people have used the Atlas Awards rubrics to innovate their own teaching locally, you know, things like that. I just wonder if there would be uh, enough interest in the community. Uh, you know, if you're a potential applicant, you can also come in and see if we could help you solve some concerns. And there's still enough to submit an application right after that session, you know, about a week. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, fine with that. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. I'm just wondering if there's enough interest in the community. And again, I can't see any chat, unfortunately, so I don't know if anybody's responding to that. No, no chat so far. No okay. responses so far. Well, Louisa, I'm, I've gone ahead and put, I'm putting you on the agenda for the 21st to do that. I think that's perfectly fine and appropriate. And um, we'll see, you know, if we get some turnout for that. No, oh, thank you so much. Um, I, I have some ideas. I'm going to uh, email you offline. Great. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Okay, well, um, any other announcements or questions uh, people want to bring up before we adjourn? So I'm looking forward to seeing some of you, I hope, at Sakai Camp. Um, and I want to thank.
Kyle Blythe and Jeff Posh at NYU for the excellent presentation on usability testing and showcasing uh, some of the improvements that they have made and that they're continuing to make. And, uh, you know, kudos to your team, NYU, because um, you've done some tremendous work and, uh, and we're all benefiting from it. And we thank you sincerely for that. Well, th thank you so much for the time and, and thank you all for the contributions that you make to the community as well. This is, this is such a great experience. And uh, yeah, so thank you, Tricia. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, everyone else. Appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll catch up with you next time on February 7th. So you guys have a good day and try to stay safe out there if you are getting snow today. <laughs> all right. Take care, everybody. So, Neil, can you still hear me? Are you still on? Yeah, let's go ahead and stop. I'm still here. You want to stop recording? I can. I, yeah, can you stop the recording? Because I don't seem to be able to do anything.